if before we get into going through the sadhana, you have any questions that came to mind in the last session that you wanted to unpack a little bit, we can start with those. Uh, it's kind of a just general question, but I've always been curious why the tantra path is quicker than the sutra path. There's yeah, the, <laughs> the, the, the short answer is because it takes more merit. More merit is more momentum and more speed. Um, the merit accumulated on the tantric path also means that there is more effort, for lack of a better word. Um, so like I mentioned last night, one of the unique features of Tantra is that you're working to develop calm abiding and special insight simultaneously, rather than as two separate projects, which requires a lot more mental effort and a lot more mental strength. Okay. Yeah. Hence more merit. Thank you. Um, to train in not being intoxicated by objects of desire, to train in not giving into anger while still looking at the energy of it and you know playing with these things, it takes a lot of oomph. So it's the short answer is more merit makes you go faster. <laughs> okay, great, thank you. Um, I think one of the things for me was the concentration. Maybe it was the hour of the night, I don't know, but you know, holding on to the concentration and also the the the, um, the the mantra as well. You know, trying to trying to do everything. You know, yeah. I found that really quite difficult. Yeah, and it and it is, and mm. the the way to approach it is in a way like I think of it in terms of like turning up the volume on certain parts, while the rest of it sort of turns down the volume. So it's like mm -hmm. for a little while, I've turned the volume up, you know, for lack of a better word, on the visualization of myself as Chen Rezig. And then the mantra is mm -hmm. happening, but I'm not so focused on it. The light's going in and out. I'm not so focused on it. The symbolism I understand and, you know, but I'm not thinking about it so much. I'm just volumes up just on clear appearance. And then I let that kind of like be, and I try and think of divine pride and connecting with the Buddha I'll become and identifying as Chen Rezig. And that's got the volume turned up, even though I'm kind of half aware that, uh, you know, made of white transparent light, blah, 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 you know, but the rest of it's not so forefront. And then I let that kind of be, and then I focus just on the mantra and it's just yeah. the mantra, just the mantra sometimes remembering what it means, sometimes just letting it be and staying with the resonance of it. And just basically, as if you take turns kind of emphasizing different components of what theoretically you're holding simultaneously, then you don't get so overwhelmed, like trying to squash it all, mm -hmm. you know? Mm -hmm. So it's kind of like you're spotlighting different sections and eventually they become so familiar that they come together or as if come together but it's gradual. So just kind of turns spotlighting mm. different sections. Yeah. And, and I think mm. the most important thing is just to try not to allow the, the fog, yeah, the fog or the fading um, where you've become overwhelmed. And so you kind of go into like a paralysis, like a focus paralysis where you just kind of like, vagued out in abstract whiteness kind of muttering mantras <laughs> half asleep <laughs> right so yeah. you know if that starts to happen mm -hmm. you know like open your eyes like look at the sadhana again get everything kind of sharpened and go mm -hmm. back in you know yeah sometimes i think when I focus too hard it, it feels really hard in here yeah in, yeah yeah yep and it's it's gotta be <clears throat> You, it's it's like every other kind of meditation where you know it when you hit the sweet spot, when mm. you're in the flow state of you have enough energy that you're maintaining focus, but it's not too much energy turning into yeah. stress. Yeah. Mm. You know, and so mm. it's like don't don't force all of the details of Chen Rezig, for example. You know what Chen Rezig looks like. Mm. If we're yeah. talking conversationally and you just kind of, even with your eyes open, think what does Chen Rezig look like? You're like white, four arms. So I can picture these two sitting on a lotus. A lot of things come to mind and then you start to meditate on it. And it's like all the details disappear and you can't remember yeah. any of yeah. them. 
Yeah. Because of the stress, right? The stress you put on yourself. So Mm -hmm. um, have a really relaxed mind and say, it can just be white and just be mantra so long as it's focused. And then often the details will clarify themselves just because your mind is happier and less Mm -hmm. stressed. Yeah. So Mm -hmm. as always, your approach is as important as what you're doing. (laughs) Sure. Thank you. Yeah, totally. Yeah, I'm glad you mentioned that. Thank you. Yeah. Um, Roxy, did you want to ask? This is sort of an Eleanor-ish question. Um, I found myself being a little confused at one point, maybe it doesn't matter, but um, toward the end, and I can't say exactly which phase, but um, first he was on my head Mm -hmm. and then suddenly he was in front of me. And I don't know at what point um, that transition happened Mm -hmm. or if it even did. Mm -hmm. And but the description was, uh, as I recall, he was in front of me and generating lots of little chin resigs going out into the world. Mm-hmm. Um, and so I guess two mechanical questions. When did that happen, if you remember? And two, yeah. um, I take it he's facing us as opposed to turning away. Yeah. If you don't have the empowerment, he then during that mantra recitation time when there's lots of light going out and light coming in and that that part with the mantra if you don't have the empowerment he's in the space in front of you facing you um or you can kind of keep the imagery of him on the crown of your head facing the same direction as you as in the very beginning of the sadhana he's described if you prefer that but um kind of switching his position even if you don't have the empowerment yet is a good mental exercise because whether you have the empowerment or not, you're having front generation Chen Rezig and self generation Chen Rezig. It's just self generation Chen Rezig can't literally be your own self yet if you don't have the empowerment. So you have one here and you have one here. <laughs> if you don't have the empowerment, if that's too much and it's too complicated and it's making your head hurt, just focus on one. Yeah, just pick either. Yeah, no, that was really. Front. Yeah. Okay. Not a really profound question. No, no, it's a good logistical question though. Um, so it's like forever the guru is above the crown of your head. In the beginning, he takes the form of Chen Rezig himself, offerings are made to him. Um, and then you become Chen Rezig and Amitabha is at the crown of your head. And mm-hmm. lights, you know, the guru becomes Amitabha. So there are these different kind of like transition points that aren't really explicitly signposted in the sadhana. It's more, again, like one part is spotlighted, a different part is spotlighted. So you kind of maintain awareness that whatever size, shape, and color, the guru is here. The guru is here. And sometimes they're in the form of Chenrezig, sometimes they're in the form of Amitabha, but the guru is always here. Now, what I'm doing is merging with the guru so that I become one in nature with and then do the activities of the guru, which are namely teaching and helping sentient beings heal themselves through teaching. But I don't need to think of all of that. It just takes the form of light. Okay. Also, may I ask one more quick question? Is practicing calm abiding and um, special insight Mm -hmm. the same thing as shamatha vipassana? Yep. In our tradition, yes. <laughs> in our so tradition, yes. holding our mind calm and then yep. focusing on the nature of uh, uh, on wisdom or the nature of is emptiness or just the way that things inhere. It's you know the words shamatha and vipassana are used with slightly different neon nuances and techniques, tradition to tradition, even within Tibetan Buddhism sometimes. Generally speaking, when we're talking about shamatha, we're talking about single pointed concentration on a, on a virtuous object from a Buddhist perspective. From a non-Buddhist perspective, it's just single pointed concentration, but it could even be on, you know, your wife or your husband. Yeah, on any object, but it's single pointed in either case. Mm. For some people, that single pointedness has an observational quality, which is almost analysis. Yeah, yeah, but generally speaking, you're just focused on one thing. Then special insight implies analysis. 
fully qualified special insight almost always refers to insight into reality, understanding the emptiness of inherent existence. Right. So you've got those two skill sets mm -hmm. on the sutra path. You're trying to get good single pointed concentration. Sometimes you're meditating just on the Buddha in the space in front, sometimes just the breath, lots of options for what your single pointed focal object is focal, you know, in the nominal sense, not in the visual sense. Mm -hmm. yeah. yeah. A lot of options, but it's, you know, you're working on that skill. Special insight, you can be developing through all your forms of analysis and through your study until you have solid, clear, accurate understanding of reality. Then, then you can bring the analysis together with the single pointedness and mm -hmm. it doesn't disrupt the single pointedness. Now, for us, we're almost like pretending that that's the case when we practice Tantra. Yeah, we're pretending that we can be single pointed and hold analysis at the same time when really we can't yet, right. but we're, we're acting as if we can. Okay. Right, so you're thinking, I, you know, here is Chen Rezig, one, you know, one face and four arms, the embodiment of wisdom and compassion who looks like this. So you're single pointedly holding the image of Chen Rezig whether you as Chen Rezig or Chen Rezig in the space in front, you're holding your focal object there. And then you're bringing to it the awareness that you, the meditational deity and all phenomena are empty of inherent existence. Mm -hmm. Yeah. But what really happens is that you go between that knowledge and that appearance and that knowledge and that appearance, but you adopt the attitude that they're happening simultaneously because that makes it quicker for them to happen simultaneously. It's interesting to me. I don't know if I can say one more thing, but I do remember sure. years ago, Venerable Steve saying that he only practices analytical meditation and he just doesn't d do shamatha really. But so I, I, I feel like all these different modalities of moving between focusing on the mandala, focusing on the image of Chin Rezig, focusing on the mantra, there's, it, it feels intermediate almost, right? And so yeah. that alone can kind of make your mind a little. Um, so maybe if we, if I, I'll just speak for myself, can kind of intersperse calm abiding in there a little bit, just focus now on this new media and get my grounding first and then move to analysis. I know the idea is to pretend to do both at the same time, but for me personally, I think I need to focus on the breath a little bit or just some, some object for a little, even a few seconds and then move to the analysis. Well, it, it's almost like when you're doing the sadhana by yourself, when you're not being led through it, right? You know, and you don't have to go the speed of the leader. When you're leading yourself through it, you read a section <clears throat> and you're using your analytical mind and then you pause and you stay with it, right? And the way in which you stay with what you've just re re read to yourself, the way you stay with it can be analytical or can be single pointed. So take, for example, just refuge in bodhicitta, mm -hmm. right? You read refuge in bodhicitta and then you pause and embody refuge in bodhicitta or resonate with refuge in bodhicitta you probably don't need a lot of analysis to strike the chord of it because it's so familiar to you, right? Yeah. But if it's not feeling familiar that day or it's not got the flavor, right? Uh -huh. if, you know, right? If it's missing some salt, then you need to think, all right, what is refuge anyway? Why do I need refuge? And you do just a classic Lam Rim analysis until you get in the flavor again. So you think I have refuge out of healthy fear of what my untamed mind will create, faith based in reason, experience and logic that the three jewels offer the methods to release me from suffering. Okay, I do believe that. I've thought about that a lot. I do believe that. Thong, refuge struck, <laughs> bodhicitta, right. I wanna be of benefit to all sentient beings. Does that mean making them pastries? No, that's five minutes of happiness, not long-term happiness. Yeah, I want to be a Buddha so that I can show them the means to heal themselves for long-term stable happiness, not just symptom relief. I believe that. I've thought about that a lot. Dong resonance. Beautifully. You know, so you're using a little bit of analysis to kind of zhuzh it up until you're feeling it again and then stay there. Great. Thank you. Even if it's just for 30 seconds, you know? Mm -hmm. 
Yeah. So, so walk yourself through it at your own pace when you do it by yourself. These practice days are almost in a way to show you stylistic options of how to approach the sadhana. So then when you do it yourself, you can pick the right pace and, the, and know different ways to emphasize as you go along. Sometimes it's hard to really feel it in just a short practice weekend because you're just kind of getting your head around the procedures. Mm-hmm. Um, but honestly, when in doubt, just do what the sadhana says, even if you're not really sure all the reasons why. You're like, okay, so now it says I'm sending out clouds of offering nectar to all the hell beings. And okay, all right. <laughs> You're like, there's a lot going on there. I need to read more about it. But how about I just do that? And you just do that. <laughs> yeah. And you are just visualizing light and the, you know, nectar light going to all the hell realm beings, soothing them, pacifying their suffering. And then they arise as Chen Ding. And, and then you read the next cool. section and you do it, you know, so it's just like, break it into chunks. It's like memorizing music or something like when you sing and you've memorized it, you can embody it. And I just remember my drumming teacher saying, well, the shaman's way is to inhabit both the rationality of knowing what the drumming patterns are at the same time as the groove. Exactly. Almost just like letting go. And it's these two opposite states at once, but I've talked to myself. But. No, no, I completely understand what you mean. And music is is the way I frame life often. You know, I was a musician before I was a, um, you know, Buddhist nun. And I think that really understanding how things are only effortless because of effort. Yeah. So, you know, you can be effortless playing the piano or singing a song, or in my case, playing the saxophone, only because you've drilled it and drilled it and drilled it and you've read it and you've looked at the notes on the page and you've learned the technique and you've used your analytical mind, but then it's so familiar that you just enter into a flow state when the time comes to join the group or when the group is now moving to the whatever concert or whatever it is, you enter a flow state together, not because you're magically harmonious, but because you've practiced a lot, (laughs) right? And then you just, you know, it's as if effortless, but it's because you're in the zone. It's not like there's no effort. It's just that the effort is joyful, right? And, the, and meditation's exactly the same in terms of when you hit that flow state, it is that blissful concentration, with, which at our level still has a little bit of effort, but it's joyful effort. And eventually it won't even need effort. It'll just be joy. But for now, it's the kind of effort that you have when you're focused on something that you're very familiar with. You know, how you've seen maybe um, the way some people are able to knit and carry on a conversation. It's like magic to me, you know, like I try and knit and I'm like, I gave up years ago, right? But, you know, I have friends who can just be like, just knitting and knitting and knitting and having a totally complex conversation and like something's cooking in the kitchen and there's like something on the radio and they're somehow like aware of all of it simultaneously. And you think, what is this black magic? (laughs) Right? But it's amazing, right? But it's just familiarity. Yeah, it's just familiarity. So... Gently, gently, um, we all have ways of focusing where we enter that flow state in our worldly life. And then you just bring that skill set to the same thing. And that um, when we did the practice the first time, my experience was that I was a little lost. Yeah. But then when we did it the second time, I felt like it was really coming together. Like I felt like there were still moments where I was like a bit lost, but I felt like there was it was like, there was more of a flow. And I think that doing it again and again will like make the flow like stronger. Yeah, you can already tell after just a couple rounds. Yeah, that's a good sign. Mm. Yeah, for sure. And, uh, you know, we would never say, um, you know, I exercised once and it didn't work. So I exercise isn't for me. (laughs) I mean, Mm. I do say that, but we know it's not logical. (laughs) Right. Um, you know, so don't say I meditated once and it didn't work. Therefore, meditation is not for me. You know, it takes a while. Yeah. Um, Eleanor, did you want to add? I, I do. Um, this is a logistical question. Um, at the middle of the during the meditation, during the the um, you know, sitting with the thought, sitting with the the, the thought at that moment. I mean, that could I. 
time is, you know, time just goes. What my question is, um, if, if that happens, is it really important to finish the sadhana? Mm. Oh, you right. What if, I mean? you, if you strike a yeah. chord, like during the mantra recitation yeah. time? Yeah. If you're stuck, not stuck, I don't mean stuck. I don't mean stuck in an awful, in an unhealthy way, but you're in the moment, you know, and it, you don't know the time, the timing of it. You say for maybe 30 seconds, but that might be longer. And I was thinking logistically, the sedana might go on all day. <laughs> and? <laughs> and? <laughs> well, I've got nothing else to do. <laughs> I mean, if you got a if you get an appointment later, set a timer on your phone. But I mean, <laughs> or the like, the dog will annoy you and say you need to walk yep. me. But I mean, you know, <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> if you're if you're in the zone, don't rush it. Just enjoy no. it. But mm, it's yeah. it's kind of like there are so many conditions that come together for us to have a mm -hmm. session that has. Um, the type of vibrance and the type of depth that makes us feel like this is successful, right? And that session where things are in flow and you're really present in that kind of timeless, magical, deep meditation experience, you can't make that happen every single session no. at our level, right? It's, mm. it's hit and miss. And the yeah. sessions that there's no particular flavor, there's no particular magic, you're just getting used to it, you're just doing it again, and you have points of, I love the words of that, I love the premise of that, and I'm glad I'm habituating myself to it, but other than that, nothing else is happening. Those are successful sessions, mm -hmm. right? Even, you know, even if it's not got all the smells and bells and magic, right? So it's kind of like you're developing the discipline of, this is the practice I'm doing, and I'm going to do it consistently because that's how it will build power and depth. But I'm not going to put pressure on myself. But if I'm having a good session, I'm going to ride with it. But it's, it, it is important that then when your mind isn't able to hold that concentration anymore and you feel yourself shift out of that state, that then you, yeah, okay. even if it's just in an abbreviated way, finish the session just you can go quickly but make sure you always dedicate mm. yeah because you want all of that energy to go towards enlightenment you want to kind of really be cashing your chips in a way or like i don't know putting them in the bank right away i don't know the perfect metaphor or analogy for this but it's like if you've put all this mental energy in you don't want it to just disperse as you stand up off your mm. cushion you mm. want it to carry and have ongoing momentum, which is part of why we dedicate the merit. So I want this energy to go towards enlightenment for the benefit of all sentient beings, you know, like stamp and then up, then up and Adam right. and the dog. Mm. Yeah. So Thank what you. do you think, do you have a resistance to finishing the session? Cause like the fun parts over and now you just have prayers to do and it feels like a chore. Is that, is that the resistance? No, I don't no, no, I was thinking if somebody comes to the door. Oh, yeah. No, go ahead. Yeah. Just be like, sorry, Chen Rezig, doorbell. <laughs> yeah. Right? Yeah. And they're like, it's cool. I already knew. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, no, I mean, be practical. But then, you know, yeah. once you're once your person's left, just quickly in your mind, dedicate. And remember that these these things are they're mental things. Mm. So it's like the, from your seat to the door, you can be thinking, by the virtue of this practice, may I become an, a Buddha in order to lead all living beings to that enlightened state? You can just be thinking that in your head as you walk to the door. It takes five seconds. You know, mm -hmm. you can wrap it up. It's, it's not you. about like sitting in some sort of perfect formal posture and doing some sort of perfect formal words. That's just the manual to get you into the right mental atmosphere. Mm. Thank you. Yeah. Good yeah. to hear. Mm. Yeah. Thank you. And certainly no one's going to be offended, right? If you leave abruptly. <laughs> and now like now, now Chen Rezig's pouting because you left halfway through the session. He's like, where were you yesterday? You didn't even finish, you know, like don't get weird superstitions. <laughs> He's not going to sulk. <laughs> Can you imagine? No. <laughs> Right. So it's like, funny yeah no and i guess just the, the reason i i want to emphasize dedicating is what i mentioned before but also because you don't want to develop a habit 
of leaving things unfinished or developing a habit of I'm bored with this now. So I'm just going to stop. No. You don't, you don't no. want those kind of habits. So, no. so to make sure you do wrap it up each time, mm-hmm. even if it's in an abbreviated way, just so you don't have that, that discipline that says I'm bored with this now, you know? Um, yeah. And you. I don't think that you would, but just kind of as mm-hmm. a general for everybody. Mm-hmm. You know. Thank you. Yeah. Yeah. Um, another piece is there are parts of the sadhana when you're doing it by yourself that you can just visualize and you don't need to say out loud. But the parts that are very obviously prayers, like refuge in bodhicitta and the four immeasurables, the mantra itself, to do it out loud, even if it's just in a whisper, is powerful for a lot of reasons. But one of the main ones is you're creating positive speech karma, which for us as regular human beings, it's so important that we have positive speech especially because so much of our day is probably nonsense speech or gossip or divisive or critical or whinging, whining, you know, like a lot of what we say is not necessary and not that virtuous. And, you know, we're working on it and we're changing our habits and, you know, (laughs) et cetera. But if any time you can find the opportunity to be doing virtuous speech, like saying the practice out loud, that can really help. Yeah, it can change the whole vibe and the atmosphere. Yeah, and it gives our speech more power so that in the future, when we have something important to say, people will listen and hear it and take it on board. I'm sure there's been times in our life where we've had something important to say that was really important that people understood and they just did not get it or just did not care or did not respect us enough to even listen properly. And yet it was really important. It needed to be said and no one was taking it on board. And that's a karmic thing. Yeah, it's a karmic thing. Of course, it's a societal thing in a toxic workplace or a problematic family thing. There's, you know, surface reasons as well. But it, it's important for us to realize that sometimes we do have important things to say. So we want to have the positive karma in our speech so that it can be heard when those times come. Yeah. So say your prayers out loud if you can, even if just under your breath. So you're not annoying the other people in your house. Yes. Um, when you do the mantra um, on your own, you don't have to chant it out loud as we have been for as long or at all, if that's awkward, if that's weird for the people in your house, but do make sure air is coming through, at least for the mantra part, because the mantra and breath combination is where a lot of the inner energy system can be purified and transformed. And that's stuff that you'll learn more about once you have the empowerment. But even before you do, the mantras are so powerful, but it's important to say them out loud, you know, for at least I don't know, a mala. Yeah, if you can. So mantra out loud is important, even if it's just under the breath. Um, other questions before we dig back into it? I have one quickie. Um, when you're saying the mantra uh, versus singing, you know, the, the tune that goes with it, what's the difference? Is it interchangeable or does each have a different um, purpose? The, the spoken one, you know, there, there's a lot of reasons to chant things together in a group, but a lot of it is just for group harmony and group energy and supporting one another. And also any beings that hear the mantra, whether they are beings like insects in the house or whether they're unseen beings in other realms, it really benefits them to hear the mantra out loud. But then when you go to saying it under your breath, no tune at all. It's just money, pay me, who my 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 money, pay me, you know, at a speed that feels like you're not pushing too much, but you're also not dragging. So, kind of a speed that keeps you alert. So, if for you it's oh, money, pay me, whom, oh, money, pay me, whom, that's fine. You don't have to go as fast as I go, and that's not even as fast as I go, but you know, I go fast because I'm used to it, not because I'm magic. I'm not magic. It's just rolls off the tongue if you say it hundreds of thousands of times, right? So, oh money pay me home, oh money pay me home, oh money pay me home, oh money pay me home is what you would hear if you had your ear right 
under my chin, <laughs> right? But no one else would hear it. Yeah. So it's like a whisper, but a whisper even, even softer than a whisper in a way. Um, still there's air coming through. Yeah. And, you know, just one mantra per bead. Having a tactile counting object keeps you grounded, keeps you focused, keeps you having a continuity. You could count on your fingers. You could not count, but having a tactile counting object is useful. So, you know, you can get it. You can get a mala, you can make a mala. It doesn't have to be fancy. It doesn't have to be expensive, but they traditionally have 108 beads. When you're in retreat, for every 108 beads, you just count 100, assuming that eight of your mantras are dodgy. Yeah, <laughs> right. So and it makes it easier to count. And uh, if you're doing a Chen Rezig approach retreat, usually it's um, minimum 600,000 Omani Pei Mehums. It takes three weeks. And um, it's fun, <laughs> it's fun, but it takes a while. And remember that mantras are that which protects the mind, right? So you can be doing this mantra without anybody hearing you just under your breath in a hard staff meeting, right? In a difficult family dinner, in traffic that's stressful and it protects your mind from going down the wrong road. Yeah, and it invites the blessings of the Buddhas, meaning you're receptive to the blessings already there. So don't feel like you have to always do it in the formal way. You know, a lot of us don't have the commitment to do the sadhana, but we do have the commitment to do the mantra. And so in that case, you just think from emptiness, I arise as Chenrezig because of bodhicitta. Om mani pimi om mani pimi om mani pimi om mani pimi om. That's the whole thing. <laughs> right? Out of emptiness, I arise as Chen Rezig because of Bodhicitta. Done. Yeah. Like that. Um, His Holiness and Lama Zopa Rinpoche recommend if you do um, 10 malas a day, it's very, very beneficial for you, but also very beneficial for anyone who interacts with you, anyone who feeds you or is kind to you, or it has any kind of interaction for you, with you it's like it lifts your vibration in a way that's really beneficial to beings. And uh, your breath becomes blessed if you do that many a day. So that's nice. Yeah, 10 malas a day. <laughs> yeah, so a thousand. Honestly, 10 minutes, that's all it takes. Yeah, once you're used to it, you can do it while walking the dog. Okay, so, um, with all of this, if it's feeling overwhelming, just put it in the category of aspiration. Okay. If any of it's feeling overwhelming, don't feel like, oh God, I have to do this from this day onward. Exactly. As she said, just think, put a pin in that. I like that idea. I'm going to work up to it, you know, or let's just see how it goes. I'm going to just gently, gently, because you want to keep a happy, relaxed mind through the whole process. Okay. So back to it. You think from within emptiness, from broom, the syllable, there becomes this vast, extensive, precious vessel. Yes, vessels, yeah, beautiful cups or something, yeah. And within each, the syllable om melts into light, from which arise drinking water, water for bathing the feet, flowers, incense, lamps, perfume, food, and music. And then you think, these beautiful things that are either here literally or that I'm visualizing or both, they're all empty in nature. They look like or have the aspect of these individual things. Their function is to bestow special uncontaminated bliss. So the bliss of attachment objects free from the attachment. Yeah. So then, you, you know, here's agyam, water for drinking, padyam, water for washing, Pupae, flowers, dupe, incense, aloe, light, gande, perfume, new day, food, shapta, music, rupa, form, yeah, this mirror, shapta, sound, the guitar, gande, smell, which, you know, up here, gande is perfume, down here, gande is smell. Um, and then rasa is taste. And sprarsa, there should be an S there, is touch or tactile sensations. Yeah, so they're blessed. And then we do the actual self-generation. 
So this self-generation is really the heart of deity yoga, and it's, it's one of the most important sections. So the six deities, um, or the six devas, sometimes they're called, basically it's the sequence of developing yourself as the deity. Or if you don't have the empowerment, it's the sequence of developing the deity in front of yourself. It's the sequence. So the first deity is called the ultimate deity which is emptiness itself. So we do the emptiness mantra, which is Om Sawawa Shuddha Sawa Dhamma Sawawa Shuddha Hum, the natures of myself, the deity to be meditated upon, and all phenomena are an essence of one taste and emptiness. Pause, okay? And here is where you could pause and do analytical meditation on the emptiness of the three spheres, agent, action, object, or you could just think of what you already have connection with related to emptiness and just stay there with some single pointedness. Yeah, so this is just an emptiness meditation with the referent being the deity, the practice, myself, all of it, one taste and emptiness. Yeah, so you just stay there. So all empty of inherent existence specifically, which means what? because it dependently arises. And so then from the sphere of emptiness, the aspect of the tone of the mantra, Om Mani Peme Hum resounds, pervading the realm of space. So this is the second component of building up into the full deity Chenrezig. So you think out of emptiness arises this sound and you hear the sound Om Mani Peme Hum as if it's resounding in space, they say it's a little bit like the sound of um, if you have a singing bowl and you've really gotten it going so it's humming. Yeah, that sound, you can picture it. The sound of a humming singing bell that you can just hear the individual syllables ringing. Yeah, so it's like, oh, money, baby, oh, money, baby, oh, money, baby, oh, money, baby, oh, just resounding in space. And it can be slower than that if you like, but you hear it even though you don't hear it with your ears. Yeah, so just out of emptiness comes sound. And then my mind and the aspect of the undifferentiable suchness, meaning emptiness, of myself and the deity, meaning Avalokiteshvara Chenrezig, becomes a moon mandala, which just means a moon disk. Yeah, just a moon disk flat, like the moon disk that Chenrezig is sitting on. And then upon which the very aspect of the tone of the mantra residing in space is set down. So it's like the sounds now become embodied in shapes, the actual letters of the syllables. Yeah. And the sounds and the written letters mix like very pure mercury adhering to grains of gold. So of course, this is, you know, very ancient language that's been translated, but can you kind of picture an alchemist playing with these different substances and the way um, mercury sticks to gold? Yeah, so the sound and the letters merge. This is the deity of syllables. And so right now you're just thinking moon disk, syllables with that sound. And that's all that is existing for you. And that's all you're focused on at this point. And then that transforms into the big transformation, the deity of form. And each one of these little sentences, you could just pause and really meditate on. You know, last session I paused a little bit, but you can pause longer as you get more familiar. And you think that that moon disk, syllables, and sound completely transforms into a thousand petal lotus, as brilliant as refined gold, marked at the center by the mantra Om Mani Peme Hum. Yeah, so it's like it all absorbs and then it reforms and just, just this like radiant white, like headlights on high beam, like the sun reflected off of snowy mountains, just brilliantly white, a thousand petal lotus. And then in the center of the lotus is Om Mani Peme Hum. Yeah. And then from the tips of the petals, yeah, multicolored light rays are emitted from the moon, lotus, and mantra. Yeah, so you've got moon, lotus, mantra. 
and tons of holy bodies, lots of Arya Avalokiteshvaras. Avalokiteshvara being the Sanskrit name, Chenrezig being the Tibetan name. We use these interchangeably for the Buddha of compassion. Tons of them going all over space, yeah? All different sizes going to everyone everywhere. And then great clouds of miraculously emanated offerings are beautifully offered to the Buddhas and their children, meaning the Bodhisattvas. So then you think, okay, out of emptiness comes beautiful offerings, anything beautiful you can imagine offering up to all the Buddhas and Bodhisattvas. And you know they experience special uncontaminated bliss in their holy minds, beautiful, happy, blissful, just make it beautiful in your mind's eye. And then from yet another great emanated cloud, a continuous rain of nectar descends, extinguishing the fires of suffering of all migrators of the hells and other realms. So to make it tangible, to make it lived, think of places like Afghanistan. Think of places experiencing floods or fires or famine. Think of places that are having a lot of turmoil and just imagine white nectar light going to those places and soothing and pacifying the violence and soothing and settling the minds. And then if you believe in hell realms, believe that it puts out the fire of the hell realms, that the hell realm beings drop their weapons, that they find relief. So whether it's literal or metaphoric, whether it's human realm, whether it's all realms, have some image in your mind of this light pacifying hatred, soothing suffering, yeah? It creates the cause for this to be the case. It reinforces the importance of these ideals to yourself. A lot is going on, but you don't have to think about it analytically if you don't want to, just do what it says in the sadhana without expectations or pressure, just visualize. See what happens. And then you think all of these beings become satisfied with bliss. They're soothed, they're pacified, and now they all arise as Avalokiteshvara. So all these suffering sentient beings now become Buddhas. Yeah, Buddhas who look like Chenrezig. And then the light rays, along with the bodies of all of these deities, the ones that were already deities, the ones that newly became deities, all of it returns and enters into one's own mind in the aspect of the moon mandala, lotus and mantra garland. Yeah, so it's like it all absorbs back into that simpler visualization and absorbs into you or absorbs into Chen Rezig in the space in front for those of you without the empowerment. Yeah, and you just pause for a sec. And then these transform again into a multicolor lotus and moon seat upon which oneself arises or in front arises Avalokiteshvara with one face and two arms. So all the steps that came before inform this image appearing in front of you, which is the same image you started with at your crown, but now you're becoming or is becoming closer in the space in front. Yeah, so it becomes a simple image once again, but it's more loaded than it was before. There's more associations and ideas than it had before. And each step of this is building your concentration and analytical abilities. He looks like this, just like he looked before. Two hands joined together at the heart, hold a wish-fulfilling gem. The second hand holds a crystal rosary. The second left holds the stem of a white lotus. If you want, you can think of the symbolism for a minute, right? You can think the four immeasurables, you can think the wish fulfilling gem is specifically related to the preciousness of compassion and that the lotus is related specifically to the wisdom realizing emptiness and that the rosary is reminding you to say the mantra and that all four together are the four immeasurables and that the three principal aspects of the path are the lotus, sun and moon that he's sitting on. You can think of all the things that you know about the symbolism of the deity if you want to, or you can just think compassionate wisdom takes this form and then gently build in details as your mind is able to absorb them. So he's seated cross-legged in the Vajra posture, fine garments, precious ornaments, because he's a supreme emanation. And so all of these ornaments and scarves and things represent different aspects of the path to enlightenment, 
Um, there's plenty of books that would explain what every little scarf and every little jewel represents, but basically they're just features related to an enlightened being based on the path that you're already on. So there's, there's many lists to investigate if you're curious. None of it is accidental. Yeah, I mean, occasionally the artist will add a random flower here and there just to be pretty, but what's on the deity themselves is all indications for practice and represent something specific. So you think he's in the prime of youth, like 16 years old, and radiates rays of light. So you want that like sense of youthful vitality. Yeah, we all know youth is wasted on the young, right? But remember when you were 16, maybe? And just like how um, vibrant your body felt then and just fearless and full of, I don't know, power, you know, health, all stamina, you know, all the things that a youth has. So you kind of bring those connotations and radiates rays of light, okay? So then you pause here on clear appearance yeah, and just try and get the details as clear as you can without squeezing the mind. Yeah, you just kind of scan down, scan up, and just get the details as clear either of yourself or the front generation, whatever you're meditating on. Yeah, and then you move on to the deity of mudra. So here now you add, once again, the awareness that at the crown, crown is it white ohm, throat a red awe, heart center a blue whom, and upon a moon mandala at the heart is also a white hri. And so representing enlightened body, enlightened speech, enlightened mind, and hri the seed syllable of compassionate wisdom. And then you bless the five places. So some of this needs a bit more commentary after you get the empowerment, but the five repetitions of Om Padma Obawai Soha and the touching of the five places with that mudra is basically a connection with the five Buddha families. Yeah, so that's what's happening there. So you have your hands in the lotus mudra, which is not quite the same as a prostration, right? Here's your prostration, right? A lotus mudra is like the open version of that kind of with your fingers coming together and you touch and bless the five places. So, you know, body, speech, mind, left, right. And in the Nungnai Sadhana, there's a more elaborate explanation if you're curious about that, but this is called the deity of mudra. And then the deity of sign is when you invite all of the Buddhas from the 10 directions to empower what you've visualized, yeah. And again, indicating the five Buddha families with Amitabha as their retinue. Yep, and here's the empowerment part. So first you request the empowerment, all Tathagatas, please confer the empowerment upon me. And then Om Sawa Tathagata Abhishekata Samaya Shri Ayahum. You, as you say that mantra, you imagine that they are pouring vases filled with nectar on the crown of your head. Yeah, all of the five Buddha families pouring beautiful vases and that's empowering nectar fills you up. And then the excess water, because you're so filled up, it comes back to the top. There appears Amitabha. How are we doing so far? Question on that last point of pouring vases of water on your head, that's with or without empowerment? You can, you think that whatever it is you're visualizing gets that empowerment. So if you're visualizing Chen Rezig in the space in front, you imagine all the five Buddha families with their vases empower that in front one. And if you have the empowerment, they pour it on you. So it's just basically where it is you're thinking that's happening, but it's happening in either case. Excellent, thank you. Yep, yep, good question. Um, Ali, go ahead. Um, I just wanted to ask, uh, I just want, I had uh, two questions, actually. Um, so when you say the, when we bless the five places, uh, what are the five, the five places? Crown, throat, heart center, left, right. Okay. Shoulder. Yep. And um, when we, uh, the hands in the lotus mudra, um, uh, you said it's different from when we do prostrations. How do we, how are we supposed to hold our hands when we do prostrations? 
Um, prostrations, you got your thumbs in, in the Tibetan tradition, right? Yeah. Thumbs in, thumbs in, together, all the way. Yep, all the way. Yep. Yeah, I, I was I was just doing it like this, so it's good Yeah, to and that's more like the greeting, the greeting one, you know, or like a namaste, you know, but, um, which is fine, which is lovely, um, but it's more like, hello, I see you, I respect you, friendliness. This is like prostration when the thumbs oh. go in. Thank yeah. you. And then the Lotus Mudra is like that with the thumbs in, but it's more open. Yeah. It, but the picture is in the Sadhana, so you can look at the picture. And so it's a Om Pemo Boy So Ha, 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 Om Pemo Boy So Ha. You can do it slower, but like that. Yeah. yeah. And in a way, it's like inviting each of the five Buddha families to come here now. And then the empowerment comes and they are here now, like that. So there's repetition of themes. Yeah, so it feels like a lot is happening, but actually there's a lot of repetition of themes and a reviving of themes. And um, once you get your head around the kind of basic components, it, it makes more and more sense and uh, it's less overwhelming. Yeah, uh, any, any bits about the um, development through the six deities? Yeah, yeah, Joanne, go ahead. Can you go back to that mantra, Om Pemo? So I just yes. finished writing it down. Oh, um, it is right there in the sadhana itself, don't you worry. Um, so here's the mudra, and here is the mantra. Om Padma Otbawai Soha. Thank you. Sure, yep. Yeah, uh, Lauren, go ahead. Hi, um, you had mentioned that the the five places represent the five Buddha families, and I was wondering which family went with which place. <laughs> um, <laughs> it is in the Nungne Sadhana. Um, usually we've got uh, Verachana, Amitabha, Akshobhya, um, uh, Ratnasambhava and Akshobhya, or Ratnasambhava and Amoga City. I often switch but you've got one on one side and one on the other. And sometimes I'm dyslexic with my Buddhas. So um, <laughs> double check the Nungne Sadhana. But you've okay. got green and yellow or else green and yellow. <laughs> okay, thank you. <laughs> but otherwise white, red, blue. <laughs> mm -hmm. Yeah, but yeah, the Nungne Sadhana, which is across the room, but um, it has a lot of that stuff um, in like little italics, very tiny under the instruction. And like, you need your reading glasses and it's aggravating, but at least it's like, it's there. So um, the book that I mentioned last night by Geshe Teshi Sering, which is called Tantra from the Foundation of Buddhist Thought Series. He, he gives a really nice overview of meditating on the six deities. And so I thought I would just read it to you just cause it's so clear and hopefully it will reinforce. So again, these six deities, this developmental process of self-generation is the Kriya Tantra, lower Tantra way of developing the self-generation. So it exists in all of the lower Tantra practices, whether it's explicitly written out or whether it's implicit, it exists for all. So deity of emptiness, deity of sound, deity of letter, deity of form, deity of mudra, deity of symbol. So um, Geshe says the first step, the deity of emptiness or the ultimate deity is a meditation on emptiness. This is the base upon which we do the remaining five steps. This step is the substantial cause for us to see ourselves as a deity and, and hold that divine identity. Yeah, so this is, they're really saying that of all of the steps, that's pretty key. So then um, as we have seen, visualizing our ordinary body as a deity's body or our ordinary consciousness as a divine consciousness is completely mistaken. Instead, at this stage in the practice, we need to reinforce and enhance whatever understanding of emptiness we have. Some sadhanas give some explanation of emptiness to help arouse that understanding. Others just instruct the practitioner to do the meditation. 
we try to bring a strong sense of the emptiness of ourselves and what we visualize, at least understanding that that is so, even though we might not at this stage have a realization of this. With that, then we can move on to the next stage, the deity of sound. With the deity of sound, the sound of the mantra, Om Mani Pime Hum, in the case of inseparability, spontaneously arises from the sphere of emptiness. It is not that we are speaking the mantra in our head, rather the sound is just there. It fills the entire space. It pervades the realms of space, like an echo in a great hall. We feel the entire environment, we become filled with the sound of this mantra. The third step in building up the visualization is the deity of letter. The sound becomes visible in the form of letters of the mantra. Our mind and the deity are inseparable in suchness, that is, in the nature of being empty of any intrinsic or inherent nature, even while they simultaneously manifest as the different shapes of the letter of the mantra. At this stage, we have not yet visualized the complete deity, but our mind, holding the undifferentiated suchness of ourselves in the deity, becomes a moon disk at our heart, a flat circle of bright white light. Then the sound of the mantra, which is re res resonating throughout the whole of space, descends to the middle of the moon disk and gradually transforms into the syllables of the mantra. The syllables differ for each deity. For Avlokiteshvara, it would be the six white syllables. For Vajrasattva, it would be either full hundred syllable Vajrasattva mantra or simply Om Vajrasattva Hum, both white and so forth. The syllables are not flat on the moon disk. They stand upright, facing inward and are usually oriented clockwise. Some people feel that the syllables should face outward because then that is the meditator on the meditation cushion looking at all this can see them. Otherwise, their backs are turned to us as if they dislike us, but we should not see ourselves as outside this visualization. The manual says that our mind is the moon disk, and that is where our mind should be. When we are in the middle, surrounded by the mantra garland, suddenly this whole visualization seems a lot more difficult, I suspect. Yeah, so the orientation of the syllables. It's important to recognize there is a process happening here, from emptiness, the deity of emptiness, the sound of mantra, the deity of sound arises. Then we visualize the nature of our mind, the mind that realizes emptiness. That mind transforms into a moon disk and the mantra slowly transforms from sound to syllables standing on the moon disk. With the deity of form, we visualize the complete deity for example, if we are following inseparability, the moon disk with Avalokiteshvara's mantra is there at our heart, and there arises Avalokiteshvara with one face and four arms. This is the deity of form. So there's a few different versions and a few different indications. So I'll just, I'll leave it there for now. But if, if you're ever wanting to read more about this process or to remind yourself, Tantra by Geshe Tashi Sering, or just Google the six deities, Alexander Burson. So the Study Buddhism website of Dr. Burzen has a really good summary of these six if you're wanting to remind yourself. So just coming back to the mantra, making sure we don't leave out the mantra. Does anybody know what the mantra means? So I don't have to tell you. Do you remember? I can, I'll, I'll go through it, of course, but if anybody remembers or has heard before, chime right in. I feel that you know, but you're scared to say. <laughs> yeah, Joanne, go ahead. There you go. The, the brief version, in the sense I've heard Om Mani Padme Om means the inseparable union of wisdom and compassion. Perfect. Perfect. See? Totally. Totally. And um, there's, of course, more to the story, but that is the essence. That is the essence. Yeah, the inseparability of wisdom and compassion. So, the inseparability of not like regular wisdom and regular compassion, but enlightened wisdom and compassion, right? So there are there other pieces now that are sparking into memory now that Joanne broke the ice? No, they talk about um, the OM being the sound of the universe, the energy sound of the earth, of Mother Earth, if you want to put it in those terms. Yeah, so it's getting in touch with the 
interconnectedness of um, humanity, of the human beings and the energy of the universe. That's universal beautiful. energy. That's beautiful. Yeah, that's beautiful. And that's, that's a, that's a more universal <clears throat> understanding of Aum. And of course, Buddhists aren't the only ones that use Aum. Mm. So that is a really good universal understanding of Aum. The, the more like Buddhist specific is looking at the syllables that make up Aum, which are A, U, and Ma, uh, um, mm. which is enlightened body, enlightened speech, enlightened mind. Enlightened mind. Mm. And Aum basically means completely purified, completely transformed enlightenment itself. Yeah. So Aum at the beginning is basically saying to have your Aum, here's what you need. <laughs> yeah. Mm. In order to become enlightened, you need Padme and Mani. Yeah. So Om mm. Mani Padme Hum, you got your Om. So then Mani just means jewel, but it represents mm. compassion. Padme just means lotus, but mm. it represents wisdom. So you have, in order to have complete enlightenment, Om, you need perfected compassion, perfected wisdom. And Hum is, may those two ideals take root in my heart. So the whom at the end of a mantra usually means everything that came before, may it take root in my heart. Yeah, may it integrate here. Yeah. But there's more to Almani Peme Hum than wisdom and compassion. Generally, there's a directive to do the six perfections. So Om Mani Padme Hum is six syllables, yes? Six perfections. So you that one for each it's a directive to practice the six perfections because we're on the bodhisattva path so do you guys remember the six perfections in any order yeah. <laughs> generosity i hear generosity you. Mm. yep patience Gener patience yep. Mm. yep generosity patience yeah. ethics um, ethics ethical conduct. Right, yeah mm. enthusiasm enthusiasm yeah remember. Concentration. Wisdom and concentration. concentration. Nice, nice. Y'all know, I know you know. Sorry to put you on the spot. I appreciate you chiming in. So mm -hmm. if you see here, Om, generosity. Ma is, um, yes, generosity, ethics, patience, joyous effort, concentration, concentration. wisdom. Yeah, so like this. And so you'll sometimes see the mantra um, in white syllables as is described in the sadhana with a color behind them, or sometimes you'll see them in the colors um, of the six perfections that they represent, um, like in this form. So, you know, either way is okay. There are many correct ways, but uh, have a looking there. So the letters um, make up the sounds. So ma is just one letter, ni is just one letter, pe is two letters to make up pe, me, hum. So anyway, fun facts about om mani pe me hum. And uh, that long durani that we do before the mantra recitation long time, um, the long durani of Chen Rezig is just a longer version of a Chen Rezig mantra. And, you know, it be, the, the kind of literal meaning is, I bow to the three jewels. I bow to the ocean of the Arya's exalted wisdom, the king of marvelous manifestations of Eritrana, the thus gone, foe destroyer, perfectly completed Buddha. I bow to all the thus gone, foe destroyer, perfectly completed Buddhas. I bow to Arya Avalokiteshvara, the Bodhisattva, the great heroic being endowed with great compassion. Yeah, so this, I guess that's more the, the meaning definition. And then this is more the like uh, word by word, although not perfectly. Yeah, Om, you will hold, do hold, do hold, hold. I request power, move, thoroughly move, thoroughly move. You hold a flower, hold an offering flower, method and wisdom, supreme guru, burned with mind. May it be removed, arrange it. So basically, however you're looking at it, it's a request to the guru Buddha may I embody these qualities. I bow to you to become receptive to you. May I become like you. So, you know, this long Durrani is kind of like to launch you 
into the shorter one. There's even a longer one yet. So it's just kind of interesting to look. There's Omani Pei Mehum is not the only Chen Rezig mantra. There are several. Yeah. But Omani Pei Mehum is going to be your friend for life. So when in doubt, Omani Pei Mehum yourself. Okay. Yes. Um, any, any other questions before we kind of leave it for now, have afternoon tea? Hi, do you happen to know if there will be a Nunye uh, retreat anytime this year? I hope. I do not know. Um, okay. I think if you if you put in a request, that might add to the momentum. So if you ask ah. the PC, that might add to the momentum. So okay. if you get lots of Thank requests, you. it's more likely. Yeah. Yeah. And so for those of you that don't know, Chen Rezig practice um, can be done in a gentle everyday way or in the like super duper Nung Ne way, which includes a lot of prostrations, a lot of fasting. It's very um, deep. It's very hard, but it's also very blissful and beautiful if your health is up for it. But it does require some fasting, um, even no water fasting every other day. So you want to make sure that you're up to it. <laughs> yeah, so your kidneys don't get grumpy. Yeah. All right. Anything else, guys? And we'll call it, we'll call it for now.